topic is a pretty serious topic, if you will. It's not a, as fun as a lot of people would want to talk of entertainment value. Alzheimer's disease and dementia. When we talk about Alzheimer's disease and dementia, we're really talking about a demise of the frontal lobes of the brain. The frontal lobes of the brain actually have to do with our greatest aspect of humanness. I mean, let's actually do this accurately. The frontal lobes have to do with organization of thought, so mental planning, our ability to multitask or hold multiple tasks in our thought process, giving children lists saying, hey, go to your room, pick up your toys, grab your jacket, don't forget to get your homework, and remember to brush your teeth. And your kid runs back there and grabs his jacket and comes back and you say, where's your homework? <laughs> oh, I don't have it. Okay, well, where's your toothbrush? Oh, I don't have it. And a lot of times when we look at failure of maturation of the frontal lobes, especially the right frontal lobe, in a, in a child we call that ADD. After a child's pediatric age, we can no longer diagnose that, Jacob. I'm sorry, it's no longer ADD. Now that is called lack of maturation of the frontal lobes. As we look at the over-maturation of the frontal lobes, we see that as Alzheimer's disease and Parkinsonism. Or excuse me, not Parkinson, but uh, dementia. So the area that's just above the eyes is an area that has to do with our feelings. And it also has to do with our ability to relate to others. Remember there was a railroad worker named Phineas Gage. Do you remember the story of Phineas Gage? Anybody remember Phineas Gage? Phineas Gage is famous because he was one of the hardest working young men on the, as they were putting the railroad through from the east toward the west. And they were working out in uh, some stone and he actually was on a team of blasters but he would go and actually uh, help to drive a spike down into the rock and then once the rock had been, or excuse me, once a hole had been set that they could put a charge in there he would back out and they'd blow up the rock. So one day Phineas Gage had gone out and someone had put a charge already in one of the holes and he went to check to make sure it was deep enough and the rod that he was using was, uh, as I recall, about 36 or 40 inches long and it blasted up, went right through the bottom of his chin and came up right through the frontal lobes of his brain. It didn't kill him. It just shot right through like a, a bullet. Yeah. It separated those frontal lobes, but it affected the vision in his right eye and it went right through that infraorbital or superorbital uh, frontal lobe area. Okay? The interesting thing is he had previously been one of the best employees he was friendly to everyone, had just a great personality. And after that experience, he became very cantankerous, hard to hold a job, very uh, curse, used a lot of cursing. And it actually became a study. You'll actually find a, a picture online of Phineas Gage posing with the rod that went through his brain. Um, as the story goes, he went from job to job to job and basically... Uh, died in ruin at a young age, okay? But a sad story, but actually gave us a big window into this area of the brain and what it actually does. And, and researchers started to look at the brain in a different way. And so when we start to look also then at this organization back into this area, we start to see some of the areas that we'd look at potentiation for long-term memory. And that starts to go down as well. So we go from our, a loss of short-term memory and all we can recall now are just those old, old memories. So a lot of times the people with Alzheimer's and dementia will have all these stories of their childhood. I remember when, and, or they'll recall someone as a, an old friend and start telling lots of stories about old friendships and old workmates and such and yet can't remember who visited yesterday. Okay. So that's a big change in this area as it starts to be affected. When we actually look uh, from a, a frontal view on the MRI, what you'll start to see is 
instead of having a nice, robust, high gyrus that's full and plump in the brain on the MRI, it'll start to look very atrophied and small. And you'll actually see where the brain will start to pull away from the skull. So instead of being up nice and close to the skull, you'll start to see where it will actually pull away from the skull. The interesting thing about that is it sets that person up then for if they have a fall injury, now there's a, a sheath that goes around the brain and blood vessels that come into the, these sheaths from along the skull and in essence that those blood vessels are basically like little tendons or strings like puppet strings holding the brain up then because if the brain actually atrophies it starts to pull away from the tethering points and those blood vessels become tethering points and those people are at great risk for shear forces if they fall when they fall even though they don't hit the head necessarily hard the brain inside will actually shift quickly and it will tear away from here and you'll actually see what we call subdural hemorrhages or even supradural or epidural hemorrhages and what will happen then is you'll see on the MRI what looks like a lenticular form or a lens lesion where it's actually bled in there and the brain will actually get pushed inward and these are strokes that occur from falls very commonly so people with Alzheimer's and dementia are at greater risk for severe brain injuries from falls that aren't necessarily the concussive type of an injury but become actually risk for bleeds and strokes due to a, a shearing fall when we look at this then of course the, the first thing that we need to do is drain that blood so get that person to the hospital as quickly as possible and then start to recover that from the stroke. Now that we can actually do a presentation on stroke and a stroke protocol for people who've had those types of injuries because that becomes a significant brain injury. Tonight though again sticking with our topic let's look at this frontal lobe and how we can maintain its greatest human expression. When we look uh, at dementias, Alzheimer's, and we'll include some discussion this evening about Parkinsonism because of the presentations that we see that link Parkinsonism. Um, let's see, Parkin, not even close. When we look at Parkinsonism, <coughs> Parkinson's disease, again, we've talked about in the past, again, as a progression of an antibody that starts to create a specific deposition of infiltrated fatty deposition in the brain or even just a protein in the brain. And the most common area that we see is the olfactory bulbs that come right in above the nose. What happens here is there are some proteins called, or antibodies called alpha-synuclein antibodies that actually start to penetrate those frontal projections of the olfactory bulb and actually then will cause those cells to become hard. When they harden, they no longer have function. So one of the first things we look for in Parkinsonism would be then a loss of what? Smell. Sense of smell. So when you check with your loved ones, you always want to make sure that they still have an acute or accurate sense of smell. When smell starts to demise, then we're looking at those alpha-synuclein antibodies actually depositing what we call Lewy body formations or fatty depositions in those cells. And those Lewy body formations then will go from there to the cells then that affect the moisture of the eyes and the mouth as well so they'll start to go in a progression loss of smell loss of tears loss of saliva I feel dry mouth dry eyes then it will also start to affect then the outputs that give output for digestion so they'll say I have constipation irregular heartbeat then they'll start to manifest the stiffness in their faces and their gait so they'll become very wooden. When you look at a person with Parkinsonism you'll see that they don't have arm swing. They'll start to get very wooden or start to have a soldier-like walk. Their arms will be locked to their side and especially when they turn you'll see there's a real locking of the arms at the side.
Okay, so those are some early indicators that will actually preclude the tremor. Loss of sense of smell can actually predict the outcome of Parkinsonism by 10 years. If I'm losing my smell, we can actually say, whoa, we need to take care of this because that will be then the demise will become then the Parkinsonism pill rolling, resting tremor. So you'll see that with the hand where they actually look like they're holding a, a pill in their hand and that's the classic Parkinsonism type presentation. The other thing is what they call a fenestrated gait when they get up and they try to walk. The brain says, I want to go forward, but they can't move. All right? So Parkinsonism falls into this demise of brain as well. When we look specifically then at the frontal lobes, when we're looking at the function of the frontal lobes, we've talked about organization. Now we're looking more to also then movement and calculations. So movement is a major key to the health of frontal lobes. Remember, <coughs> frontal lobes also, then if they have a strong movement responsibility, movements of the eyes are a quick window into the function of the frontal lobes. So we can actually look and you can actually do a simple test with your loved ones to see how much function is there still in movements of the eyes. And what we look at are what are called saccades. Saccades are actually a movement of the eyes to where we're looking to fixate to a point or where our eyes are actually going quickly to a point and holding and then coming back. So the way that we do it is we'll have a person stand in front of us and then we'll hold our thumbs up for them to look at as, as targets and then the instruction is look at the thumb that moves and then hold your eyes on that thumb and then look back at my nose and then look at the thumb that moves and then look back at my nose and what you're looking for is the smoothness of that pursuit and you want them to be able to hold their gaze onto that thumb and without moving the head okay because the frontal lobes will actually push them but they should not push the whole head to be able to look there. So Jacob, come up and let me just show everybody if you don't. So what we'll look, just stand right here facing me, please. So everybody can see. He's just going to look right here at my nose. And what the instruction is, again, is look at my thumb. Look at the thumb that moves. And look at that thumb for just a moment. And then come back to my nose. Okay, ready? Good. And then again here. Good, again here. And you see the first time he just... Gives a little bit of a head nod and then he corrects himself. So we're good. So we just do it again. Good. And one more time. Good. So he's good there. Next thing that we want to look at is something called anti saccades. So now it's to actually look away from the side of movement. So this time you're going to actually look away from the side that moves. So look at the thumb that's not moving. Okay? Good. And again. Come again. Good. One more time. That'll do. And then again. Okay, so again, just following the instructions. So there is just a little bit of, for him, an attempt to look. So he, he moved his head and he also looked. So we don't see a demise of the frontal lobes. We actually look at something else associated with attention. Okay, now, next thing we can do quickly to assess is stroking the palm. So a palmar stroke is another indicator of frontal lobe change, right?